consultant, or principal consultant actually as well with uh, my own company called Biochar Consulting. And uh, again, like Meta said, president of not-for-profit called Biochar Ontario, um, which is actually part of a larger initiative called the Canadian Biochar Initiative, or the CBI. And we're really the Ontario chapter of the CBI, um, which was started back in December 2008. And the bio biochar initiatives really are organizations focused on disseminating information about biochar, who and who are also attempting to create a paradigm shift sort of in the way we grow food in this country by creating sort of carbon carbon smart or climate smart smart agro agroecological food production systems. And we're actually closely affiliated with the International Biochar Initiative, which is. Um, created an international organization, and the U.S. Biochar Initiative as well, of course, um, with our neighbors in the northeastern part of the United States, uh, like the Pioneer Valley Biochar Initiative in Massachusetts. So this presentation will outline for the audience really what, what biochar is and is not, um, some of the various uses and benefits of biochar, some of the work um, within the global biochar initiatives, and some of the ideas regarding the utilization of biochar that could help farmers deal with the recent and future droughts uh, that have inflicted North America and global farming over the past several years, including last year's drought here uh, in the US, um, in particularly south, southwestern US, which significantly impacted uh, last year's grain production. So, but first, uh, the presentation's really intended to introduce people to the concept of biochar. Um, then I'll describe how biochar could be used to improve water efficiency in agriculture and help us move our food production systems toward the use of agroecological practices and technologies. Uh, so once again this year, the lecture is very timely, has significant relevance to the topic of this lecture series, which is really human security. And as I said, I'm part of this an initiative that's attempting to create a biochar industry in Ontario as well, and Canada. Um, I helped actually start the Canadian Biochar Initiative many years ago, and again, the president of the local organization, Biochar Ontario. And this is an emerging industry. Um, it's focused primarily on creating an industry in Ontario, um, but we're also exchanging international information, ideas, with a number of partners uh, around the world. And this information sharing uh, really has implications that reach far beyond the borders of Ontario or Canada um, in terms of the utilization of biomass, especially as an energy source and as a fuel and a feedstock for green economy <coughs> industry. So inside Ontario, as well as sustainable biomass export industries even from Ontario that are likely to be quite significant over the next few decades. So first, because this presentation is intended to introduce everyone to biochar idea, we'll start here. So biochar is both an ancient and modern concept. It's actually a fairly simple idea. What biochar really comes down to is utilizing charcoal in agriculture, those soils. Uh, it's an idea whose knowledge has been around for thousands of years, but it's something that's mostly been lost and is now only being rediscovered. The so-called green revolution is something I want to come, to come to because that forms the basis of most of the existing modern agricultural technological management practices that we use today, much of the world. So the green revolution actually came to the forefront because it's based on an industrialization of agriculture that was able to produce amazing abundance in a mechanistic way by using large quantities of petrochemical fertilizers, pesticides, and perhaps most importantly, fresh water. But the Green Revolution worked because it forced nature to abide by our rules and force fed it, basically a diet of petrochemical derived chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, while extracting the maximum amount of the, out of the natural systems, usually in a very unsustainable way. So the Green Revolution was never about leveraging nature to improve efficiency or production. It was more about brute force and hugely energy and material intensive inputs, mostly agrochemicals and water, 
to be to sort of beat nature into submission and gain dominance over it, really. While at the same time, it was actually weakening it. So biochar actually is this technology that attempts to work with nature as much as possible to leverage nature's tools of biology to produce a sustainable abundance. So in a world of increasingly scarce and expensive resources, it's a concept that's being quickly revived in order to help ensure soil sustainability and thus ensure that our biological resources can be sustainably harvested over the long term, even if the other inputs are reduced becomes or they become scarce or significantly more expensive. So what is biochar? It's essentially the term for the charcoal for soils. Everybody probably knows what charcoal is. It's the stuff you burn in your barbecue. No, actually it's not. In technical terms, char is the product of biomass that's being heated in the absence of oxygen. If you have any biomass and you heat it up without the oxygen, to high temperatures, about 400 degrees Celsius, it actually turns into char. Biochar is simply char that's intended for soil instead of your barbecue, whereas charcoal is the word we use for the fuel. We call it biochar when it goes into the soil rather than charcoal for soils. But why put it in the soil? After all, it's just really pure carbon. And it is not a nutrient and it isn't what's considered a fertilizer. Carbon in soils is generally considered good, but biochar is only good if it's made the right way, meaning the structure and the co-amendments that are integrated into it have to be right and to be beneficial to the soils. So even though charcoal is good for cooking, and we make it, if we make it properly, charcoal can also be good for the soil. And when good bar charcoal goes into the soil, we call it biochar. But what are the reasons biochar is so interesting to us? We need to ask ourselves what it is that's happening to the environment especially, and what society is looking for. One of the things is energy. So we need three other things, things to survive as a species. We need food, we need air, and we need water. And yet we're entering an era of scarcity an era of enormous environmental stress and change. Fossil fuels are becoming more expensive and environmentally destructive. The tar sands and oil from the Gulf of Mexico, for instance, are now becoming our dominant liquid fuel sources. And these fuels are more difficult to extract, process, and more expensive. <coughs> and extracting and burning them often results in significant direct environmental change, plus indirectly burning them of course, results is in changing the chemistry of the atmosphere in such a way we're now seeing changes to the Earth's climate, global warming. So one of the very clear facts is actually that society does need liquid fuels to function. So liquid fuels really are and will continue to be the dominant energy carrier around the world for decades. Although we are trying, we cannot change our dominant energy infrastructure overnight simply by increasing investments in renewable, renewable energy. So liquid fuels can't be easily created from wind or solar or geothermal or any other kind of renewable energy that makes electricity. The only reasonable, viable substitute for fossil fuels is likely to be biomass. However, if we don't wish to destroy our forests and the natural world, farmers will very likely need to deliberately grow this biomass. Or better yet, the byproducts of our existing food crops and our production could become a feedstock for the bioenergy and biofuels economy. So this is one of the potentially significant and often overlooked parts of the emerging bioeconomy. We can't eat everything we grow. We peel oranges and bananas. We don't eat the shells of nuts or the bones of animals. But why biochar? We ask we need to ask really what happens when we make biochar. It's probably actually one of the only technologies that can do three things at once. The process of creating it produces useful energy, mostly in the form of heat. And putting it into the soils, if it's done right, can help the soils in many other ways, which can help us to grow food. But just as importantly, it can sequester carbon and help mitigate climate change. 
So biochar is the byproduct of a process called pyrolysis, and that results in biogas, bio-oils, and biochar. It's the dissociation of biomass. So while the, bio, the pyrolysis process can capture and release significant amounts of energy, mostly in the form of heat, it can also produce materials in the form of liquids and gases. And usually the process is self-sustaining and net energy positive. So the process of making it is considered actually an alternative energy if we can use the heat, oils, or gases productively. But note also that pyrolysis is possibly one of the few ways of making bio-oils. <coughs> potentially be transformed into liquid fuels. However, the biochar initiatives really aren't, in, including Biochar Ontario, we're not really interested in the biofuels part. We're really only interested in the biochar part, even though pyrolysis is also getting a lot of attention from the energy industry. So many don't actually believe that, I, that pyrolysis bio oil actually will become any economically viable anytime soon, however. But we do want to see a substantially produced biochar being made from things like crop, far, farm residues, crop waste, um, forestry, sl forestry, forestry slash, and food processing residues. So that we can be begin to start to deal with the other problems we have, which is really the result of our greater use of non-renewable resources like oil. Keep in mind also that when biochar is added to soil as a soil additive, under the right circumstances with the proper management, we should have many other benefits, especially if we wish to improve marginal or poor quality soils that have been degraded by our past activities. And of course, when I refer to the soils uh, that have been degraded, I'm actually referring to those soils that, that have been abused by modern agriculture. And this really means that most of the soils found around the world today probably could use some biochar treatment. And what else can biochar do? Why is it really that special? Well, it's primarily because it's the only technology that can do those three things. So the process makes energy, it can improve our soils, but it can also sequester carbon and actually help to directly mitigate climate change by permanently storing carbon in the earth, in the soil. Well, many of us use the biochar or many of us in the biochar initiatives are placing biochar, call placing biochar in the soils actually reverse carbon mining. In other words, putting the carbon back underground. So actually, could ask, is there anything that you can think of that can do that while also producing energy and improving food production capacity? So that actually obviously doesn't describe carbon capture and storage, which is that dominant technology that the energy industry wants to use to capture carbon and put it underground. So I, I mentioned that farmers are very likely need, need will very likely need to grow the biomass that society needs to create liquid fuels. However, we sh would all probably agree that energy biomass should not be grown on our best agricultural land because we need this land to grow food. So how do we grow both food and fuel abundantly? make the best use of the other unused <coughs> biomass resources we have at hand. That's where biochar actually does the best, because we believe that biochar can be one of the tools to help us create a sustainable bioeconomy by helping to ensure we have sustainable soils where we have good soils, and improving the soils where the soil quality is currently marginal, and remediating the lands and soils that have been previously degraded by the ongoing destructive land use practices of conventional farming. 
So I just wanted to mention one more thing about climate change. And I know Meadow is always interested in this side. She's seen this presentation, but uh, you might ask yourself really, how is it biochar re really used for climate mitigation? So biochar is considered a climate mitigation tool because biochar can address climate change indirectly. That's because when plants grow, they use a known process called photosynthesis. That's the equation up there. Photosynthesis means combining the carbon dioxide in the air with water that's in the air and soils into oxygen and glucose, carbohydrates. This process is, of course, one of the fundamental building blocks of life. Oops. So biochar works with the global carbon cycle. So this is a simple diagram of the global carbon cycle. And what does this have to do with biochar? Almost all the carbon that is taken in by plants with photosynthesis is eventually returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide or methane when plants decompose. So completing the cycle. So once a plant is dead, most of the biomass, this decay process happens in a matter of weeks, months, or maybe a few short years. But when we transform that biomass, the carbon embedded in the cells of the plants into biochar, instead of leaving it to rot, we're effectively storing it as solid carbon when we put it in the soils. And this solid carbon, the biochar, does not degrade or turn back into CO2 very quickly. In fact, it stays in the soil for a very long time. The half-life of biochar is typically hundreds or even thousands of years. That means for every ton of biochar placed in the soil, this means that about three tons of carbon dioxide never makes it back into the atmosphere as CO2, at least not in our lifetimes, or the lifetimes of our children or grandchildren. Thus, biochar that is sequestered into soils will effectively remove that CO2 from the global carbon cycle. So this is another side-by-side -side diagram showing that carbon cycle again. This was produced by Johannes Leighton, the founder of the International Biochar Initiative. It shows that when we create biochar from plant materials, we're interrupting the carbon cycle. So this makes more sense than trying to just store carbon in plants and trees. Although planting trees is essential, we, if, if we do want to mitigate the effects of climate change, all the plants and trees that we grow will eventually die and decompose back into CO2 as part of the natural carbon cycle. So planting trees is not a permanent fix to climate change. The only permanent way to fix the CO2 problem is actually to reverse carbon mine. In other words, converting a portion of the Earth's biomass into solid carbon, biochar, and placing it back into the Earth, into our soils. And because biochar carbon will stay in the soil and never return to the atmosphere, at least not in our lifetimes, we will have an effective means of permanently removing the excess carbon from our atmosphere that is resulting in the climate change. Of course, for every ton of biomass we turn into biochar and put into the soil, we also need to grow at least an equal amount of biomass back if it's to have a real effect on climate change. Thus, our very best option is to use the biochar to help more plants and trees grow as quickly as possible. So putting it into context, this is a chart that lays out our different energy technologies we have. So we have on the far left is fossil fuels with its net emissions of carbon dioxide. Just to the right is the infamous carbon capture and storage which are supposed to capture a small part of our emissions from the fossil fuels, like coal plants. They actually don't work quite well, but uh, the diagram depicts uh, that you can actually make more energy and burn more fossil fuels. We have the truly renewable sources, like solar, wind, hydroelectricity, etc., that effectively have no CO2 emissions. But on the far right, with and biochar and energy production, we could actually become a strategy to help mitigate climate change because it's fairly simple to do and would require relatively little research before it become, could become widespread and have some very important benefits for agriculture and food security. So in summary, we're attempting to use nature to provide benefits in several ways because the CO2 is taken up by the plants converted to organic carbon molecules like cellulose and lignin. 
The carbon is in the plants and then fixed in the charcoal when it's turned into biochar and effectively stored in the soil when the biochar is placed there. And because the storage is permanent, for all intents and purposes, we can say this is a carbon negative energy. As long as you're growing more plants, the more biochar that you produce, the less CO2 will be left in the atmosphere at the end of the day. And one of the things I should point out is this. The capacity of the soil to store carbon is actually huge. Soils actually right now contain more carbon than all the terrestrial vegetation and the atmosphere combined. And because biochar is so stable, it's expected to stay in the soil for hundreds of thousands of years. And it, because it has very good and long-term stability, especially in cold soils like here in Canada, there's a huge carbon sequestration potential for biochar in Canada, because we're a huge country as well. So this provides Canada with an excellent opportunity to become carbon neutral, or even carbon negative. I actually don't expect that biochar Canada will probably lower our net emissions of CO2 potentially quite a bit if we could take this to the next step. Because there is literally decades of carbon sequestration value in the soils of Canada. But since biochar does more for the atmosphere than just carbon sequestration, we have to try to maximize the other benefits from biochar as well. For instance, several studies have shown that biochar is able to significantly reduce methane emissions from soils, especially anaerobic soils or wet soils. And of course, methane is 21 times more powerful than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. And other studies have found decreased emissions of nitrous oxide from soils. And nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, but 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. But most importantly, I think, Good quality biochar that is deliberately placed into soils as a soil amendment can have benefits to crops and plants. And we know that biochar placed into soil will stay in the soil and keep the atmosphere and help the climate by returning carbon back to the soils. And it's permanent. So we really only need to apply it maybe once or a few times over a few years. Of course, the other benefits are equally as important, if not more so. And those are that we get to retain soil nutrients and keep them in place longer. And we can help to prevent contamination of our freshwater resources, since agricultural runoff is actually one of the main sources of water pollution in the world. This might also mean that over time, less fertilizers are, are needed to be applied to our crops and soils, which also translates to less pollution but also less cost to farmers, which should hopefully translate to less cost for all of us, including our food. And the process of making, of course, is a scalable technology, which should be both good for both large and small uh, food growers around the world, which should be able to make, hopefully, affordably uh, biochar on their own fields using their own feedstocks. Because they don't necessarily need multi-million dollar equipment to make biochar. Actually, I believe this fact is especially good for small-scale farming. And small-scale farmers, for instance, could be part of a cooperative that owns and shares a system between themselves. And uh, then they could affordably uh, put biochar into their own fields. Now keep in mind, making charcoal again is one of the oldest technologies known to man. And if food growers start converting their residual waste their biomass resources on their farms and forests or woodlots into biochar and using it in a way to, to improve their soils for better crop and forest production, then the process might be good for the farmer will also be good, good for, the, for the climate, while also producing energy, which can displace fossil fuels in, as an energy source, while helping the plants grow by holding the nutrients, preventing them from, from being washed away in the rains while also helping to hold water in the soil, and even possibly preventing other potential greenhouse gases from create, being created in the soil and entering the atmosphere. However, the modern technologies for making biochar are much different than the old ways of making charcoal. They're actually cleaner than most biomass combustion technologies, and they can be made at a small scale right on farms, 
and close to cities. And while pyrolysis plants can have can and have been built that integrate the production of biofuel and energy, and while the conversion of organic matter to biochar and other products can be made sustainably using local resources, the fact that pyrolysis systems are a distributed energy that could also produce valuable biochar for use in the soils close to where the systems are operating means that producing syngas and other additional energy production, either in the form of fuels or electricity, could mean that the production of biochar becomes quite economical or economically attractive to smaller scale producers to make biochar right on their own farms or forests or woodlands. Thus, we could be able to see integrated biochar systems in communities across the landscape. If we leverage the various sustainable feedstocks and process them into, into integrated and sustainable systems with net capture, safe storage, and use, we can increase the productivity of our soils at the same time as we produce energy. So if we choose to use organic resources for making sustainable biochar in places like Ontario, there are various sources of sustainable biomass we could use, things like residuals from short production short rotation crops, wheat straw, corn stover, forestry slash, manure, or almost any other green waste. Now we know that Canada and other developed countries can create these integrated biochar systems using medium to large scale pyrolysis plants. What about the developing countries? The great thing about biochar is that it can actually be made at the smallest of scales, right at home and in the kitchen or backyard. For instance, Next generation biochar stove makers have been implementing programs to disseminate hundreds of thousands of micro gasification stoves along among many third world inhabitants, most of whom continue to cut down forests to make charcoal and fuel to cook and feed their families. So using these small biochar producing stoves and fuels other than wood like paper or cardboard or sawdust briquettes or coconut shells or husks or mango cores or palm fronds or sugarcane pulp or sugarcane shavings or straw or corn cobs or twigs or nut shells or rice husks or dung or even food aid packaging, which was suggested by somebody. How could this could allow developing countries to make considerable, considerable amounts of biochar to help the soils and agriculture in these countries? while also preventing a significant amount of trees from being cut down. <laughs> so if you consider a typical family in Africa that already burns about seven and a half kilograms of wood for the, or the charcoal equivalent every day just for cooking, as these biomass stove programs are implemented around the world, those countries that implement the program to prevent the cutting of forests for fuel could have huge positive impacts. Even though they only produce about 100 kilograms of biochar a year, which is really 300 kilograms of CO2 equivalent, the amount of carbon that's actually sequestered by avoiding the tree cutting by a single family could be 10 times as much, and that's every year. That means more than three metric tons of wood not being used and taken out of the forest for every family that uses a biochar to stove. <clears throat> and some experts actually believe that around 600 to 800 million people and families worldwide need improved cook stoves. So you multiply by that by three metric tons per family, and that's a huge wedge in the climate story. And in developing countries, in the global south, these people are most in need of biochar. So, 500 million metric tons of sugarcane bagasse pictured here are actually also already being disposed of every year as a result of the existing sugarcane ethanol industry, with hundreds of millions of tons of forestry residues also left behind every year as a result of the existing forest cutting. And waste hundreds of millions of tons of agricultural residues generated around the world by every rural family and farm. This could be utilized to turn into heat to cook by turning the biomass into pellets, it could then be used for such things as the improved cook stoves that make biochar and avoid substantial amounts of forest cutting. Of course, the benefits of biochar do not end at agriculture. So in addition to helping to grow us more food more affordably, 
Bioturf can also be used for environmental remediation, restoration. It can be used to help restore degraded or contaminated land, and that's other uses for filtering wastewater, because it's been shown to absorb contaminants like heavy metals, PAHs. It can be used in stewardship projects to control pollution emanating from municipal wastewaters and rural runoff from farms into rivers, lakes, and eventually oceans. And if you were at this presentation last year, you'll probably recall that we were proposing a significant Japan biochar soil remediation project. Because after the multiple disasters in Japan last year, people tended to talk about compensation to farmers and fishermen for losses incurred. But the massive wave that shattered buildings and flooded farmhouses also created a disaster for the soils because a lot of these soils ended up being washed away, literally. And the few people who did remain after this also had to deal with the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster as well, which was, of course, the worst nuclear disaster possibly in history, but at least since uh, Chernobyl, and at least it estimates of a billion becquerels a day of radiation leaking from Japan's nuclear plants, with the total actual radiation leaked probably exceeding Chernobyl. With at least half the radiation affecting the ocean environment rather than the land, there are actually still worries that the Fukushima nuclear plant could conceivably affect around 20% of the country. So the Japanese government has said that areas around the crippled plant are likely to be uninhabitable for at least the next 20 years. And probably expected, the radiation is expected to be high somewhere for around the next 300 years. Of course, the zone that was affected the most was the tsunami zone. And of course, this coincides with the nuclear disaster zone. And this zone is where they are in most in need of the serious long-term soil remediation work because the contamination uh, also caused damage to the soils which had been affected already by the tsunami, which caused what remaining soils were there to become salted or salinated. We therefore launched a project last year called Five Planets uh, in Japan uh, to explore the idea of using biochar to help decontaminate the soils around the nuclear reactors in Fukushima by stimulating soil fungi and removing ra radionuclides via bioaccumulation with biochar and mycorrhizae, essentially mushrooms. Although this project actually never got off the ground due, lack, due to a lack of funding and support from Japan, the Japan Biochar Association actually did confirm to us that the technologies could in fact take up substances like cesium from the soil. So we believe by, that by using biochar to deliberately stimulate the formation of hyperaccumulating mushrooms within a nuclear forest recovery zone, and then using robots to harvest and destroy and sequester the resulting mushrooms, we could begin to physically remove the radioactivity from the soils and allow for future farming in a compressed time frame. So in addition to our Japan remediation project, we were also attempting to move forward with a number of other projects here in Ontario. <coughs> so these are demonstration projects we were attempting to show how biochar can be utilized in other ways here in Ontario. We still plan to undertake research into the synergy between biochar and biodigestate, probably by partnering with the Zushio Cooperative. Uh, we believe mixing biochar and digestate, or liquid manure, will be a way to improve the biochar land application practice. Um, we're also, right now, we did a small project on the green roof of the Carrot Common here in Toronto. Uh, this focused on biochar use in green roof materials, structures, and plantings, including some food growing areas. And the owner of the Carrot Common was our partner on this project, um, and we actually had to design uh, the community space on the section of the roof and a small Japanese tea garden that we were going to build. Uh, unfortunately, um, 
we didn't go through with this. Uh, our partner on the project fell through on that one. So <coughs> we are hopeful that we can eventually move toward the design and establishment of also a biochar educators kit to facilitate student projects at schools here in Ontario as well. <coughs> The main project that I'm involved in right now actually is called Currents, and Currents stands for the Collaborative for Urban Renewable Toronto through Sustainability. And this is a project that began as an exploration into the ways of utilizing the massive amounts of wood waste that will be generated by the ash trees in Toronto that are dying over the next few years due to the ongoing emerald ash borer epidemic that's now playing itself out in southern Ontario. So the initial estimates by the city were that about 850,000 ash trees were likely to die over the next several years <coughs> in Toronto, with millions more expected to die throughout the GTA and beyond. And already the ash borer has been detected as far as ways, as far away as western Quebec. Um, and it's an insect? An emerald ash borer. It's a little insect that looks like this. Uh, it bores underneath the bark of the tree. So there's Millions expected of these trees expected to die, um, and already the the city managers have their budgets constrained and are looking at attempts to deal with this issue, um, along with paying, of course, for ongoing transportation infrastructure. And of course, this blight has already killed millions more trees in southwestern Ontario and Michigan and Ohio and Indiana. So our current project is also about managing this wood waste and turning a potential huge cost for the city into a possible revenue source for the city through the sale of these biochar-based fertility products that can be used by emerging local food industry. So with the project, the current project, we plan on producing biochar locally from the ash tree residuals while also producing bioenergy. So we, we would, ash is a good tree, we want to use the, the, the heartwood of this tree as good stuff, like, like this beautiful desk here, which is a hardwood uh, stuff we can use for flooring or whatnot. But then we can take the residuals, we can produce bioenergy, we can produce biochar, we can sell that back, uh, and, or the city can actually produce revenue. So if we can produce local foods, hopefully using technologies of agroecology with biochar, creating nutrient-dense local organic foods, while sequestering biochar into the local soils, while also helping Toronto deal with some of these issues arising around energy and water that have resulted in contamination of the Great Lakes Basin, we could have a win-win-win. So our first project of the Toronto Currents uh, team is actually to try to designate a district of Toronto as the Toronto Sustainability District. So we're in now the process of organizing a series of community charrettes to discuss the idea of creating the sustainability district in the Port of Toronto, uh, actually on the currently industrial port lands of the Toronto waterfront, which the city hopes actually to eventually develop into the new downtown. So this is the place where the mayor said, oh, maybe we can put a casino or port of a Ferris wheel or something. And of course, the original idea we had on the board was to build a new local food terminal in the downtown area, probably on the east end of the Portlands, near Tommy Thompson Park. So this was intended to complement the existing internationally focused Ontario food terminal, which is located in the west end of Toronto, and which is primarily serviced by trucks flying the 401 and the QW. But in contrast, the new local food terminal in the Portlands on the east could be serviced by multi multimodal transportation systems, including road and rail and water. Since it's located on the waterfront, it includes a rail spur that's used to that was used at least to service the old Hearn generating station, which is shut down, used to supply the coal by rail. Since the Hearn generating station is shut down, it's owned by OPG. It now sits vacant and derelict. There was an idea that the building could be also serve as the, as, a, as the nerve center for a local foods community in Toronto. So the idea behind the Toronto Sustainability District would be to designate the Portlands of Toronto as a place 
where only the most cutting edge sustainable buildings, ideas, and technologies could be deployed as the new downtown area is being built. It would essentially be the first LEED community in Canada. LEED is, of course, the uh, building certification body, meaning leadership in energy and environmental design. So the idea behind the move would be to help Toronto to attract the best and brightest minds in sustainability and sustainable design to help create a vibrant, new, livable waterfront for Toronto that integrates the best designs and ideas of sustainable cities. The architects and planners could build every building in the community in that zone. So we also had the idea, of course, that a portion of the land within that sustainability district that is owned by the city, part of Tom Thomas Thompson Park, and a section of land adjacent to the North Fort Lands Energy Center, the natural gas fire power plant built next to Hearn, could be transformed into a local food hub that could service the growing local food industry in southern Ontario, thus helping to provide fresh, healthy local food to Toronto residents, while also serving as a public demonstration site for the various new energy and environmental technologies like biochar and vermicompost and anaerobic digesters and local urban food growing systems that are all being developed as part of a global initiative to create more sustainable cities. So part of the reason for creating a sustainability district and center of urban sustainability in Toronto was also to help accelerate urban biochar production and research and development of the new technologies that could be applicable for cities to help transition to a new energy and environmental paradigm, while also providing some measure of food security for the residents of the city of Toronto. So while many people in this new biochar industry now believe that it is only a matter of time before soil carbon sequestration methodologies are recognized internationally, as a way of effectively combating climate change. And the methodologies for doing this will likely include recognition for biochar sequestered in soils. We believe that it will also <coughs> become an important solution to environmental issues as well, including not only war global warming, but also things like non-point source, non source pollution and other water issues. Which brings me to the biggest, but probably the most underreported environmental issue in North America this year, which was not Hurricane Sandy. Although that was definitely a disaster, it has been linked to climate change as well. Probably the bigger disaster that happened this year was the severe drought that affected almost the entire continental United States, including many parts of Canada. The severe drought this year was genuinely alarming. If the type of trend that continued that happened this year happens year after year, this could lead to food shortages worldwide, perhaps even starvation in many more parts of the world. Coupled with the severe storms, the risk of loss of life and livelihood could actually be unprecedented. In some of the if some of the predictions of the U.S. National Center for Atmospheric Research come true. We may actually be entering a prolonged 25-year drought, according to them, in both Mexico and the central United States. And given that the biggest problem facing humans and the USA in particular is peak oil, and the fact that cheap energy is no longer possible, the effects on the price for conventional fertilizers and agriculture, and for long distance transportation of food and other products could be quite severe. This year in Texas, they went through the worst recorded drought, one year drought ever. It was considered that the 2012 drought in the entire US Midland, Midwest actually affected more than 80% of the U.S. corn and winter wheat crops, more than 70% of the oats and more than 10% of the soybeans, and triggered actually another rise in food prices around the world. And that could of course lead to even more severe food protests across much of the Middle East and in countries like the Philippines and Afghanistan and North African countries like Egypt, since these rising food prices actually translate almost directly into street protests. And we have a serious, to seriously consider any measures to conserve water. 
in case the extreme predictions of a looming 15 to 25 year drought in Mexico and in the central US actually causes this situation to repeat itself year after year after year. And biochar should be able to help because of its amazing water holding capacity. It's been shown with some biochars that they actually have about three to four times water absorption capacity per unit volume. In other words, good biochar can absorb three to five, four times its own weight in water, and some as high as 10 times or more water. And I actually first noticed something about biochar in some of the pot trials that I did in the summer of 2009. And that year I did my first pot test with biochar on my balcony using a dozen pots filled with some clay subsoil I found <coughs> by a construction site near my home. I actually didn't expect much to grow in these soils, I was right. While most of the plants survived, they didn't flourish, and by summer were barely more than a few centimeters tall. However, that summer I also went on an extended vacation for one month. And I live in an apartment, and these plants on my balcony never see a drop of rain because they're sheltered from the rain by the apartment above me. So during the entire month that I was away, the plants never got a drop of water and were thus exposed to an induced drought. When I came back from my vacation, I looked, it looked to me like all the plants were dead. However, I gave them a good watering anyway. What I saw was amazing. Some of the plants that I thought were dead came back to life and started to grow again. But importantly, what I saw was that it was the plants that were growing in the soil with, that had biochar that actually came back first and came back strongest. That same fall, a company in Quebec called Blue Leaf also came out with a report on the results of their first biochar trials. And they reported on the total plant biomass, including root lengths, which also show increases after biochar application. So the feeling was that improved plant resilience to reduce rainfall and or irrigation and greater temperature extremes could be achieved with the addition of biochar to soils. So this is likely due to two main factors, increased water holding capacity in the soils and an improved balance of air and water in the root zone of the plants. So there's a belief that these factors, along with the increased mycorrhizal colonization, or better, better nutrient transfer and possibly reduce fertilizer needs, should also to help reduce crop loss in bad years and reduce overall long-term costs of farming. So just this year, the Journal of Arid Environments reported that biochar used in sandy substrates, where it's concentrated in seeding root zones, could in fact significantly increase seeding resistance to wilting. And Alberta Innovates Technology Futures is now in the process of evaluating biochar within the extensive marginal solanensic soils of Alberta by testing for the effects of biochar in terms of increases in crop yields due to the anticipated maintenance of soil fertility, quality, and productivity. Which is why I believe we need to take the use of biochar seriously, especially in light of the expected climate changes that could cause severe difficulties for farmers everywhere, including here in Ontario. Although I have not yet had a chance to test it for myself, I also expect that biochar might provide increased wet weather tolerance due to better drainage, especially in heavy clay soils, which here in southern Ontario could be a blessing since with the changing climate, we might expect more periods of heavy downpours, causing saturation of the soils, and more frequent periods of extended drought during the growing season, either of which can ruin a crop. So this drought tolerance, again, was shown to me and confirmed this summer. In late June of this year, I went downtown Toronto to demonstrate to make how to make biochar to in your own garden to Steve Mann, who's a professor at the University of Toronto. So I demonstrated making biochar in a small tin can stove using some Quebec softwood pellets that I bought at Roa. I showed his daughter, picture here, how to make her own mini biochar stove with a tin can, a hammer, and a nail. So during the demo, we actually cooked a steak to show how the heat from producing biochar can be used practically. And the biochar that we produced was eventually placed into a pot 
uh, that we filled with some soil that we found in the corner of the alley behind his house. He's right downtown Toronto. Uh, and then another pot we filled just with the soil. We then planted two tomato plants, one in each pot. And we placed them on his roof deck, which is right at the front of his house, exposed to the open. So during the hot, dry weather of summer, this was July, Barely a drop of rain fell this summer. But also, Steve, this uh, gentleman from the U of T, needed to go on vacation as well, even though he had been watering. He actually went away for a couple of weeks to Europe later in the summer, at which time the tomato plants actually never got watered and dried out in the summer sun. But when he came back from being away, he also found that his plants that completely dried out. However, amazingly, he found that the tomato plant that was planted in the soil with the biochar not only survived the drought, but it was even spreading new leaves. And the second plant with biochar, without the biochar, was on the ver verge of dying. Although with subsequent watering, it did eventually come back to life. It was never as healthy as the tomato plant with the biochar. And most recently, we also participated in a Toronto Urban Agriculture Summit that took place at Ryerson University. And Biochar Ontario, being an official sponsor or partner of the Urban Ag Summit this year, I hosted one of the many seminars that took place at the event. We also just did some work in Dufferin Grove Park, and we used some locally produced biochar in a tree planting experiment. And the biochar we used was actually produced in a brick oven in the park that was used to bake bread for the farmer's market that is held there every week. And after baking the bread, there's a small amount of biochar left over, which we washed, we removed the ashes, and placed it around one of the new saplings that's been planted in the park in the previous year. And one of our board members, Mr. Harry Hoff, he was the lead on this project. He designed this tree planting experiment down there and provided the training to the volunteers and assisted in the digging and the placement. Uh, and we also had our, of course, our table every year at our summer event, Potato Fest on the Lapley Organic Farm, by Ontario being started by organic farmers. We were able to talk to more farmers about the possible benefits of biochar soils this year. So I do believe that growing forests are actually where we need to go with biochar as well. It's really our best bet for winning the battle against climate change. And probably the best bet for ensuring food and water security as well. Planting trees. So really of all the climate mitigation techniques, planting trees will more than likely outperform any meager attempts we make at burning biochar to soils. Although I also expect that using biochar should help with the forestry growth and possibly also seedling survival rates as a way to ensure more reliable fruiting of trees within orchards, food forests, mostly due to the, this improved drought tolerance. So with the recognition of biochar as an option for soil carbon sequestration, payments, in other words, carbon credits, biochar might even be able to assist with the financing of these forestry projects for reforestation and afforestation. For example, under the Red Plus protocols for carbon financing that are being put together by the World Bank under the U new UNFCCC rules. So I'm going to be watching for any talk about this during the upcoming COP18 summit that will be held in Doha, in Qatar, in the next couple of weeks. I really believe that part of the reason there's such a great interest in biochar is really because it becomes such a fantastic climate change adaptation tool for both developing and developed countries. I also believe that there if we are to replicate many of the best management practices around biochar, and if these are to be applied to land around the world, we really could tackle the many issues of climate change directly, not only because biochar could become a major carbon sink while helping us deal with substantial waste issues, but also because it has the potential to directly and substantially improve soils by holding water in the soils and increasing the drought tolerance of our crops and bridging the gap to food security by helping to increase humanity's capacity to feed itself. So with the world population, of course, having already exceeded 7 billion people, and on course to reach 10 billion people, 
Many are wondering whether we will be possible to feed all of these people without destroying our living environments, including our climate, in the process. I believe it's likely that the only way to feed everyone is to completely rethink agriculture. And I believe the biochar could be a key tool in helping us to do so. So in summary, by converting our residual biomass resources in farms and forests into biochar, this could make sense for the environment because it produces energy, it displaces fossil fuels, hopefully as an energy source. It can help the soils and the crops in many ways by trapping nutrients, by holding water in the soil, by preventing greenhouse gases from escaping. It's relatively easy to do. It's one of the oldest technologies known to man. The modern technologies for making it are much better than the ancient ways of making charcoal and are often cleaner than most biomass combustion technologies. They can be made at a large scale, a medium scale, a small scale, right on farms, close to the cities. And of course, we can utilize these biochar technologies in synergy with other agro-environmental technologies to leverage the amazing power of biology to help restore the world and hopefully make right some of the insults of the past, and also those that we continue to inflict both on ourselves and on nature. Thank you. Thanks so much. Isn't that great? Biochar is not my word. I mean, that was actually a word coined by the International Biochar Initiative, which was originally called the International Agrochar Initiative, because these were soil agronomists, basically, that were looking at charcoal that was found in some of the soils. Somebody then put a trademark on the word agrochar. And so they had to find a different word. And they thought biochar would be the best word for it because the decomposition of biomass through pyrolysis results in biogas, bio oils, and biochar, all from biological resources. So biomass turns into three things. Yeah. So uh, in, in the so-called underdeveloped and undeveloped countries, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the thing you are going to introduce is already being practiced and which is being replaced yes. by replaced by, by the, the green uh, revolution technology. Or yeah, so called yeah. green revolution um, by by chemical yeah. uh, Monsanto's solutions. Yeah, by chemical so. mechanical manual manual chemical this uh, yeah. um, uh, and uh, what what major you are taking to prevent all this uh, transformation or, or transition of uh, the natural uh, system well, to this unnatural system? It's a good question, but I can't actually answer that because we're only an NGO. We're actually an unfunded NGO. We're not a government, and we have no control over what the, what the uh, corporations do. All we can do is advocate our side of the story and our technologies and say that this is another way um, of moving forward and hopefully people will listen, hopefully governments will listen. I don't have a big, I, I don't have a lot of, uh, I guess, confidence that the big chemical companies will listen. They might if they see there's a potential for, let's say, usurping this technology and and controlling the technology and, and, uh, and uh, then sort of replacing what they've already got as a solution with another solution. Although it's not going to be easy because this is not something that really can be trademarked. A very different, difficult to pack. Very much can be done right in your household. Right? And all of this information for making biochar, you can go on YouTube and look up biochar production systems, stoves, ovens, retorts, there's everything there that you can find to make this stuff yourself. Because I'm from a rural background and mm -hmm. I live in the rural years. Yeah. 
And were already people are using had been using yes this uh, so, but in the, especially in the and it is rapidly changing and uh, what what measures you're working to take so that all this uh, I I'm not really a policy person in the sense of being able to fix other countries' problems with the, the social changes that are happening and the, let's say urbanization problems and other other issues. I can give suggestions about, uh, of course, getting this information out. I mean, that's probably the biggest thing is, is, is uh, education and letting people know that this, their practices are actually better for them than to replace what they're already doing, let's say, with this new method. Um, so, of course, there'd be a lot of voices in that, in that realm. You'll, you, you probably, of course, are aware of um, the campaigning by, uh, what's her name? Uh, Vandana. Vandana Shiva, yes. It's, of course, she was she studied at the University of Western Ontario right here. Um, and then sort of gave up on all of what she was studying and went back to India and said, no, look, we've got to go back to agroecological uh, practices. And, uh, she actually wrote the foreword for one of the most seminal biochar books there is, which is the biochar uh, solution, which was written by again another ecological advocate. But if the voices aren't being heard, we have no money. We can't advertise like uh, like the big corporations. So I can't really again give you an answer on how we can prevent this from happening. As much as I mean, there are people. I mean, I I am, I am working with people. As I said, this is a global organization. I do know people in India that are moving ahead, and people in Africa, and people in South America, and people all over the place, or Southeast Asia, um, who are looking at this and saying, yes, this is actually, this does work. Um, the, the concepts in Africa, for instance, uh, I know that, for instance, I did get an email last week from uh, a Christian organization that uh, actually was assisted by one of our board of directors here in Biotra Ontario in the first years, uh, he was a board member uh, that actually did a business out in Calgary, but he ended up going to Africa and helping with this Christian organization. They now, I think they've reached uh, something like 6,000 farmers over the last three years who are using the, now these techniques uh, in Kenya. But uh, with the population of 6 million, that's still a drop in the bucket. Yeah. I just want to mention the reason uh, and I'm thinking back to the two slides you showed about uh, tomatoes and other plants growing better with biochar than without. Is one of the key components of biochar is carbon 60 or polar ends or buckyballs. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though you can synthesize carbon 60 out of graphite, uh, or sorry, gra yeah, graphite, uh, it also occurs naturally in various uh, rocks uh, in nature. Every time there's a thunderbolt. Mm -hmm. uh, which there are 60 million a minute around the earth, all the soot and the pollution in the air gets turned into carbon-60. Mm -hmm. So uh, carbon-60 is, is a natural product, and they've shown, and I've got a picture of it, where they've taken wheat seedlings, for example, and after six days they uh, um, uh, watered it with, with distilled water versus the buckyball water, and the uh, rate of growth has improved by 60 to 70 percent. They're healthier, and as you said, uh, drought tolerant and uh, uh, blight tolerant, which is really important. So uh, one of the, the areas that I think the biochar people should be looking at is, is the natural fullerenes that are in, uh, in, in biochar. Mm -hmm. And you can, in fact, take those carbon uh, buckyballs, which they've managed now to make water soluble, but just, just like any other carbon, like diamonds or coal, it's not a natural water soluble product. But people have figured out how to make it water soluble, and it's got all kinds of really interesting medical and biological properties. Mm -hmm. Well, I, as I've studied biochar over the last uh, probably four years, I've realized the amazing versatility of carbon. Uh, I, well, I mean, it should be obvious we're, we are carbon based yep. living thing. Carbon. There's a reason that everything, all life, is based on carbon. Carbon is this amazing molecule that has 
the ability to transform pretty much everything. I mean, uh, the 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 so-called carbon economy I mean, really is all about uh, leveraging life and life forms. Um, so we're looking at, at the vast array of different technologies that can create be created using carbon and biochar is being looked at now by a lot of uh, researchers and we have been involved fairly closely actually as well with the University of Western Ontario and also U of T um, and a number of other universities here in Ontario and across Canada and around the world even, um, on looking at different uses and different products and byproducts of uh, this process of pyrolysis and gasification and uh, the different types of technologies that produce char as a byproduct, um, potentially looking at the oils and the gases, the oils being quote unquote oils, not in the sense that like petroleum oil, um, it's more of a water based oil that will actually degrade. Um, it's also been a lot of vinegar type uh, components. It's a very complex uh, chemical struct, chemical component in, in so called oils. Um, but that have a lot of interesting uh, chemical properties that can be used for different things. I was just uh, communicating with a gentleman in Waterloo who's been looking at uh, using the byproducts of his fast pyrolysis system where he's actually pyrolyzing sugar um, and he's producing a char that he then upgrades into a fertilizer using the pyrolysis, pyrolysis oil but he's using the oils, but he's fractionating the oil and he's using some of the oils to impregnate the biochar to make a fertilizer. And some of the other oils actually go into making ink for laser printer jet cartridges. So he's got all these different applications. So there's you, a number of different you things. heat sugar or sugar beets right, to make, uh, or sugar, sorry, sugar cane or sugar beets. Yeah. One of the byproducts is molasses, obviously. Yeah. And that, that's used as a food coloring for bread. And uh, Coca-Cola. And Coke, right. <laughs> uh, in fact, so if you look at in molasses, one of the trace elements in molasses is buckyballs, it's carbon yeah. 60. So they are now thinking of using, instead of using graphite or graphene as the starting material for buckyballs, which costs something like $5,000 for 100 grams mm -hmm. to get pure carbon 60. Yeah. Uh, they're now looking at using molasses as the starting <laughs> Uh, which only costs a couple of dollars a ton versus five thousand dollars a ton for the other ingredient. Except, except I still have a little bit of a problem of turning food into other things. But I was going to mention on, on the uh, turning turning something into something more valuable. Um, what was I thinking? The, 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 on the graphene side, um, there's been some amazing research that's going on, for instance, in California and other places on, on the structure of biochar. Because biochar, when it's when, when biomass is heated with the oxygen, so it doesn't burn, it decomposes, and you create these oils and gases and chars. The graphene plates that are formed in the charcoal structure actually have some really very unique properties that, in a sense, they could be. Um, there's, there's, they're, they're like, um, what am I thinking? Uh, electronics. Um, they're semiconductors. They actually have properties similar to silicon or silica, which is used in, in computer chips. And these same properties that we know work very well in our electronics actually are actually being used by plants in the soil and by the microbes in the soil. So they are, plants and, and microbes are actually using electronics through the exchange, that they've actually shown that the exchange of electrons between, for instance, a mycorrhizal fungi root hair and a, a let's say, a, a bacteria, this actually through, through electrochemical interfaces between the surfaces, is exchanging electrons using using uh, quantum mechanics essentially, and this is some of the basis for for the ion exchanges between the roots uh, and the soils. So, so when you add nutrients, when you add the 
fertilizers to the soils. It's really the biology at the quantum level and these exchange of, of uh, and at the chemical level, it's an exchange of these nutrients between the soil uh, biological uh, components plus the inorganic components, which include things like graphene sheets and other, other um, carbon <coughs> materials within the soil structure. What about uh, George Monbiot's uh, fear that large corporations would get into the business of uh, sequestering uh, biochar in yeah. the fields, plantations? And it is a fear. It is a fear, I mean, obviously. I mean, it hasn't happened yet, and the economics aren't there. Um, there is always potential that that could happen. I think that things would really <coughs> cause trouble. I mean, there would be probably some pretty dire uprisings if it were the case. I mean, it's already happening with or without biochar or a price on carbon soil sequestration, um, but these so-called land grabs in, in, uh, in Africa, let's say, where um, the Chinese and Korean companies are already buying up large portions of land. But the reason they're buying the land is not because of climate change or some sort of carbon pricing. It's because they want to ensure their own food security. So they're buying up land to be able to say, let's say in the future, we'll want to be able to grow food for our own people. They're, that's why they're buying up the land. Doesn't the Amazon need it? The, the declared rainforest, like where would they get the, what would, what would they make biochar from to try to the residuals, replenish? As, as I'm the, saying, the, the residuals from the existing forestry operations and the existing food production systems and the existing waste streams like sugarcane ethanol. I showed you the mound of the piles of sugarcane bagasse, which exist something like 100 million tons a year already. Uh, and that's probably a figure from a few years ago. And so there are huge amounts of waste. And a lot of this is actually landfill. I mean, even here in Ontario, a lot of our waste are still landfill. I mean, even our green bin program, we hear stories every once in a while that it's actually going to landfill because they'll open up the recycling, the, the composting plant that will run for three weeks or three months or something like that. Uh, and then uh, the neighborhood will complain of smells, they'll shut it down, and they'll start shipping out everything back to landfill. And, and then, of course, we've got problems with the dying trees, which we also have to replace. So we're looking at various different feedstocks that hopefully we're never going to cut down a tree. And our aim is actually to use biochar to plant more trees. That's, the, that's our policy purpose, essentially. Is we're, we're trying to deal with the bigger issues like food security, climate security, water security, and air as well, security in the sense that um, we're dealing with some pollution problems. Uh, I, I've been dealing with a gentleman that works for the World Bank um, doing projects. He, he lives in, also in Waterloo. And uh, he's been doing projects in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia using these small stoves. The stoves he does, he, he makes, doesn't make biochar. He's still unsure whether it's going to work in Mongolia. But uh, he's been producing clean cook stoves for the local people in their yurts because they still burn coal as their main fuel source. So he's been producing clean coal stoves that actually produce less emissions than would be produced or are existing already in the air of, Mongo of Ulaanbaatar, which is an extremely dirty city. So he says that actually when the air comes into the stove from outside and gets exhausted at the other end, it's actually cleaner than the air that came in. Less pollution, although it's not breathable because there's no more oxygen left, he's burned all the oxygen. It's actually cleaner. So he's actually creating stoves. And so the same thing with biochar stove, making stoves. These are clean cook stoves that could potentially uh, reduce emissions from the production of charcoal existing in using the old technologies of the mounds of, of uh, dirt where they're producing charcoal in the traditional way. And a lot of smoke, a lot of air pollution. Uh, if, 
you replace that process and no longer make charcoal as the fuel for the cooking, you can now reduce the air. Could talk about the for the housewife, the uh, health effects of cooking in a, mm -hmm. well, a whole family of cooking in an enclosed area and having all that smoke. Well, I, me I mentioned that um, briefly in my presentation, is that around 300 million people in the world, at least, or families, um, need some sort of cleaner cooking um, methods because these are people that are really at the lowest rung um, are still using open fires, some of them indoors, especially, um, to cook. Usually the, the, the wife is cooking at home inside her hut or her place of living uh, with the children right there beside them on open fires. If you can imagine a campfire in your kitchen on your stove. I mean, it's that dirty. And so the, the mortality rate of children, especially the young children under five years old, is something like 50% of, of all child deaths are, are really caused by the indoor air pollution. And so levels of asthma, levels of, uh, of, of chronic problems caused by this indoor air pollution. So we're looking at technologies like these small stoves, and that's the demonstration I did down here at U of T to produce the biochar that helped the tomato plants survive was just with the tiny little stove I made with, I made with a coffee can and, and a tomato can. <laughs> it's that easy. And but there are companies producing these in large larger quantities. A, a, an Italian company, for instance, called World Stove, is producing them by the millions to disseminate to African countries like Kenya and uh, other sub-Saharan countries. I'm curious about the Toronto Sustainability District mm -hmm. project. How far along have you got with that discussion with whoever you have been discussing with? Well, you may have, I don't know if you were, got an announcement to it, but Meta actually is the host uh, through Science for Peace of Currents, which is the, the Collaborative for Urban Sustainability of Toronto, which was just created this summer. Um, so it's about two months old or so. We have a working group of science and peace. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if you want to find out more, come tomorrow night. Speak to me, and I'll tell you how to get to my place. And there's a potluck supper. <laughs> find out more about it. So we're essentially we are myself um, as president of Biochar Ontario, another board member of Biochar Ontario, actually Harry Harry High. I mentioned him in, in the presentation <coughs> story as well. He planted that tree in Dufferin Park, Dufferin Grove Park. He's actually 72 years old, I believe, and he's got more energy than I do. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's on the Kearns team, as well as the former dean of the Faculty of Forestry at the University of Toronto here, uh, Dr. Sandy Smith, um, as well as Dr. Brad Bass, um, who here at the Center for Environment, I believe, uh, as well as uh, an adjunct. Um, he's with Environment Canada. Um, and we have as well Ron, uh, who's from Ryerson University. He's a sustainability um, student. And we have Steve Mann, who I did the presentation for. He's, uh, he's really all about water. He was the inventor of the hydrolophone, the water instrument, which is sort of like a, a pipe organ for water <coughs> that makes sound with water. Um, brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, and uh, so we have, we have a good team. I've got a, another uh, possible suggestion or tie-in for biochar, which you probably haven't looked at. Uh, you mentioned the, the drought situation. Mm -hmm. Um, I've read that it's probably part of a three or four hundred year cycle uh, mm -hmm. in the states where the yeah, it's about the El Nino and yeah. uh, whatever. And it was interesting. They were saying that the the first settlers, had they come fifty or hundred years sooner to the states, they wouldn't have been able to survive because of the droughts. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was about the time that the Anastasi yeah. were moving off right. their land. Yeah. 
So there, there's two there's two sort of uh, whammies that are coming. One is a, a second a second drought, uh, yeah. which could affect Canada as well. It the is, other one uh, is a wheat blight, which hardly anybody is talking about. That I think started in Africa, is spread to uh, India, China, mm -hmm. and is now heading east and west. Yeah. And the current monoculture wheat crops don't have any resistance to this blight. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that if you combine uh, wheat planting with biochar, uh, that might provide some resistance to both the wheat blight and to the drought tolerance conditions that we're about to. It's a possibility. I mean, uh, and again, it's because of the carbon sixty. Well, there have been some studies that have shown, for instance, that uh, biochar. I know I, I correspond a lot with people that you know, I mentioned the northeastern. Uh, United States, the PEG, the Pioneer Valley Biochar Initiative, which is working out of the, uh, they work closely with the uh, University of Massachusetts along with um, NESFI, the Northeastern, uh, Northeastern Small Farm Institute. Um, so they're, they're trying to do different things with biochar there, and they've had quite su good success uh, out of the University of Massachusetts research into seeing biochar um, actually preventing some of these blights and also in forests. Um, so some of their proponents there are foresters that have used biochar successfully, uh, based actually on research that was done in Japan um, by the Japan Biochar Association, which is the oldest association actually in the world. Um, they never called themselves that until recently, but they've been, they've been utilizing biochar, and biochar has actually been a recognized soil amendment since about 1985 in Japan. So it's nothing new for Japanese. Um, but they've done research with with all sorts of different things like blight and drug resistance and all this stuff. We just, it's difficult to get access to that information because it's probably not electronic and it's all in Japanese. Yeah. Have you seen any uh, comparisons of energy or heat yields from producing biochar compared to just burning a biomass for heater energy? Yeah, um, that's actually, there, there have been quite a few studies on the life cycle analysis um, versus traditional combustion. Really that when you pyrolyze them or when you gasify biomass especially, um, and release most of the volatiles and leave behind the carbon, you're leaving behind potentially something that could be burned. It could be an energy. Could we use it in our barbecues. It's part charcoal. Um, really what you're releasing, you're releasing about 60% roughly of the energy of the biomass when you gasify it and you release the volatiles and leave behind the carbon. So the carbon does contain about 40% of the original energy. You could use that to produce more energy. Um, however, I believe that the benefits of the biochar could outweigh. Life cycle analysis, of course, will tell you that, oh, we're not getting all the maximum value out because we value the energy. We say we put a price on the energy. So far, because there is no market for biochar and nobody's willing to pay for it because nobody really knows about it and how it works. And so people aren't giving any value to that. Therefore, yes, in a, in a, if you're looking at it from that perspective, people will say, well, why don't you just burn it? You'll produce more energy, you'll get more money by doing combustion, by burning it down to ashes. But then you have to counter argument that there are other benefits. And so doing the life cycle analysis starts to become very complex, especially if you're going to start talking about carbon balances between CO2 emissions and CO2 sequestration if we're starting to put the biochar into soils. Uh, I think uh, actually Derek Paul here did a good study a couple of years ago uh, prior to our, uh, we had a, a um, policy event here at U of T uh, also hosted by the Faculty of Forestry, um, where Derek actually did a paper showing that, that uh, you need to essentially 
target the worst soils and try to produce bio, regrow biomass as fast as possible if you want to create the carbon sequestration benefits or else you will be actually emitting more carbon into the atmosphere just like you're emitting carbon in the atmosphere when you burn biomass. People say, oh, that's carbon neutral. But in fact, you are emitting carbon into the atmosphere. If we were to take all the forests again, burn all the forests down, if we weren't going to regrow those forests, obviously, all that carbon from the forest is now in the atmosphere. That's now worse for the climate. So that's why our purpose really is to grow more forests, more food, and more green stuff. That's the purpose of the biochar. If we can use the biochar to do that while producing energy, if we can capture that energy and do something good with it, like produce electricity or produce bio oils or something, some other materials, then maybe we can find value in multiple places through the same process. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, I have some experience working in the lithium security project. Mm -hmm. And when I was talking with some of the, some of the farmers, the major problem they have is to collect the water, storage the water, and deliver the water that they need in their, um, um, in their crops. Yeah. So if you said that the resumption of water by biochar is three times higher yeah. capacity. Do you have an idea of the release of the water from the biochar? Like how long is going to take to release the water? Because it's an interesting yeah. Well, the, that, the, the drug tolerance that I've, I've experienced yeah. in my own trials, and I, when I did the first experiments of that, and I saw that uh, back in 2009, I actually reported that. I went to the, to the North American Biochar Conference in Colorado. And I talked to the sort of the head of the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, and I said, look, this is what you should look at, drug tolerance. I think there's some big things here. But I haven't seen a whole lot. And actually, it was only in this year when the United States Biochar Initiative had a conference in California yeah. that they started really talking about this because the US was going through this severe drug. And now, they're starting to say, look, oh my god, we have to study this. We have to figure out what's really going on. Uh, the, the difficulty is that biochar is not biochar, it's not biochar. Because biochar is a generic term. It means charcoal, essentially. Um, it's sort of like, what was the analogy I used? It's, there's several analogies people use, but it's, it's like uh, saying fish. Well, what kind of fish, right? I mean, or bug, or bug, like what kind of bug? There's so many kinds of biochar. Each one will have different properties. So depending on what you're turning into the biochar in Haiti, whether you're using nutshells, or you're using cassava waste, like peels, or, or you're using some other feedstock, you're gonna, and depending on the process you make it, you're gonna, produce something that may have slightly different properties than what the, what the guys in California did, or what the guys in Japan did, or what we're doing here in Ontario. They're all going to be slightly different. So you can't generalize and say this biochar has three times the water holding capacity, this one has five, this one has seven, this one has two. They might all be different, may even be different from month to month. But hopefully, each one you produce will have some capacity to hold water and some capacity to re re-release that water as well. And one of the things that I think is important, on top of the actual physical, because if you look at biochar under a microscope, it actually looks like a sponge. It's got all these little holes. And the physical structure actually is what's holding the biochar, or holding the water, sorry. But it goes beyond that because, as I was talking about, these, these quantum mechanical or the quantum uh, interactions and the, and the chemical interactions, it also, there's, there's been studies showing that the biochars and soils actually help stimulate things like mycorrhizal fungi. 
and mycorrhizal fungi in the soil act as sort of extensions of the roots. So if you can stimulate the mycorrhizal fungi in the soils using biochar, at the same time you're holding water in the soil using biochar, and the mycorrhizal fungi put their little rootlet tentacles deep inside the pores of the biochar to extract the water from the pores that's being held in there, you've got a, a, a double whammy there that could help quite a bit. So your purpose of putting biochar is not just to put the biochar, it's also to help the biology. And that's why I pointed that out in this, in this presentation, was what we're really trying to do is re-enable the agroecology. So the sort of food web and the, and the living soils, the real, not, not what we now currently do, is essentially put in chemicals, dumping, dumping these fertilizers, dumping these chemicals on in order to force feed our soils to produce, rather than leveraging nature and the soil biology itself. Yeah. I was going to ask about no-till agriculture research, mm -hmm. uh, unrelated. How did South Africa produce uh, oil when they were boycotted? Maybe I don't know the technology. Was it from coal, gas, or something? Sassel. Oh, Sassel, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's basically coal. So it's not for paralysis. So yeah. the oil that you get here is not... Well, it's actually the same thing. Um, pyrolysis is used, I mean, pyrolysis is used by the folks in Alberta and the tar sands. Actually, the University of Western Ontario that did, is doing a lot of biochar research is also developing systems for, for Shell and Conor Phillips and for, for oil sands upgrading. It's the same process. It basically fractionates whatever you put into the machine into different parts. So your bio jar oil is not a fuel for combustion. There are companies, and Canada is actually a leader in this, in taking the bio oil fraction of pyrolysis and actually separating out the water and upgrading it into a fuel. So there are companies doing that, but it's rather econo uneconomic, I guess, compared to the price of oil. Unless there was a price on carbon at, applied at the source, and the price of oil went sky high. It's uneconomic, basically, to produce bio oils from this process. It would cost six dollars a liter just to produce, not including refining, upgrading, delivering, and pumping into your tank. You'd probably have twelve dollar oil or, or per liter. <laughs> it's just not. It's not viable on, on the economic side, even though it can be done. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not viable if that's all you're trying to get. Yeah. Oh, if, yeah. you had, if you had a good market for the biochar, so that this yeah. you're taking then what would be a bioproduct of manufacturing biochar and you're selling that, would that make it economically attractive? Well, that's why, this is partially why the Canadian biochar industry was created back in 2008. The bioenergy companies that had pyrolysis systems said, look, we have been trying to produce bio oil, energy, and whatnot from our waste agricultural and biomass resources. It's uneconomic for us. We can't survive. We need another, basically, to develop another market. We see these soil scientists saying, look, biochar is good for soils. We have biochar because when we produce our bio oils, we have chars. <coughs> We've been throwing that out or burning it. We don't care about that. Dynamotive was a company that was going for quite a while. They went bankrupt because they didn't care about the biochar. They were giving it away. They said, well, now, uh, somebody said, uh, I heard, that what would help would be if there could be a law saying a certain proportion of fertilizer now has to be biochar. You're, was that your that idea? Was, that was actually not my idea. Um, but I am the, probably the number one promoter of that idea, and I created that idea around the world. So how, how can we make that happen? That sounds like a political project that it I would is, love to it be involved in. It is basically, it's a legislative mm -hmm. trick for making biochar worldwide. Just say every kilo of fertilizers must have a carbon molecule in it, or a fraction of fertilizer must have carbon. 
where's the cheapest place to get the carbon that would go into fertilizers? Probably from charcoal. Maybe from coal, but that, frankly, is not going to be good for soils. What is going to be good for soils is char biochar produced properly. It should help the plants all on its own. We might be able, able to produce economically um, competitive biochar-based fertilizers already, even without any legislation. But I mean, it would be great if we had a legislation that says, look, let's make sure that every farmer that's <coughs> buying fertilizers, because they buy hundreds of millions of tons of fertilizers around the world every year to fertilize their farms. If that had a fraction of char on it attached, basically together with the fertilizer, they'd be sequestering the carbon every single year. Maybe the farmers could get a carbon credit by doing that. And they could then offset the extra price and cost increase that might exist by slightly more expensive uh, fertilizers. But maybe the fertilizers would actually be less. Maybe they'd end up using less fertilizers. Oh, geez, well, the uh, fertilizer companies wouldn't like that. They'd start selling less fertilizer. So it's, it's not going to be politically easy, I don't think because it's still too early in the game to, the, as far as the research. The research in Alberta that I also mentioned uh, in the presentation just started this year. Um, the funding through Alberta Innovates Technology Futures, AITF, was secured in February. Uh, they've started their first uh, purchase of systems this summer. I believe they're just starting to produce some biochar that they're hoping to put in soils next summer. And so this is probably the first of three year trials um, in Alberta with Alberta farmers in Alberta soils. And that's just Alberta. Um, so there's no, under, no other research except in Quebec um, underway in, in Canada so far. So we're still years away of being able to say this is something that can be applied on broad scale. From what you've said, uh, uh, this research um, would be much more important in the United States than in Canada because you showed a map of, yeah. of the drought well, areas. Alberta is always uh, quite, ahead of the, yeah. quite ahead of things, yeah. but they did have drugs. We have drugs here in Ontario. Yes. I was talking to a farmer. Not up as bad as that. It's not as bad. No, no. Not nearly as bad. Um, and that's why I said this year's United States Biochar Initiative Conference, which was held in California, they did have a huge part of the discussion. I didn't, I wasn't able to go to that, but I know that a lot of the discussion, because I was following was, on what, Twitter, was, was there, all about uh, the drugs. Yeah, yeah, you, you talk about these companies without saying who's there, but what were there people from agricultural research oh, organizations? Yes. The USDA, yeah. the United States Department of Agriculture, yes. is huge on top of biochar. I mean, they've been doing this since, like I said, I talked to the first people yes. in 2009 about this issue yes. of drug colors. Yeah. And I noted it to the top USDA guy at yeah. that conference. And he said, yeah, this should be something maybe we can look at in the future right now. We're looking at whatever else. This year, I mean, there were probably three to 500 people. I'm not sure the exact numbers coming out of that at that conference. This is a major. U.S. biochar conference, the biggest so far, um, and and it was it was a I believe five or six day event with hundreds of seminars. And it was a major major event. So the, and these there are actually research results presented at these. There are okay. yes the, because it's the conference and, and so uh, but, but actually the the first biochar North American biochar conference in Colorado had the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, as the keynote speaker. So they are very much aware of this. Yeah. And they are very much pushing on this. Um, but again, it's a policy decision of whether there's going to be carbon credits or whether there's going to be even a carbon market at all in the US, whether there's going to be some legislative changes, whether this is economic to do. Because uh, once you start dealing in the economics of all this stuff, then you're really, really in a tangled way. I mean, as, as great as it, as it is, there's a hell of a lot of things we do that are great that we don't do because it's not economically viable. And the reason you about this not economically viable because 
each uh, industry very specific. Mm -hmm. It's and very regional type like of thing. Every part of this uh, like process is a good, right? But it's not as good as some specific like, Well, process. I wouldn't say not as good. I think it, you have to prove that it can be replacing something else possibly that is already being used. For instance, right now we use conventional fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and we we'll still need to use those, but maybe in another form. But we also have to prove that other form of fertilizer is going to be something that's useful, or as useful as what we know already. We've got a basis of information around which, how which we use, we grow foods and do agriculture, and how we produce energy. I mean, we know how to burn coal. We know how to produce <coughs> electricity. We're starting to learn how to, how to put up solar panels and wind turbines, but again, not economically viable without subsidies from the for instance, here in Ontario, the Ontario government initially providing 80 cents per kilowatt hour to put up a solar panel. And then that dropped, but Germany did the same thing. And a number of European countries did the same thing, where they subsidized. And of course, the fossil fuel industry is hugely subsidized. I mean, Elizabeth May always points that out. <laughs> We're talking about carbon tax now because of the fiscal cliff. Like bring carbon tax in. Yeah, they, they, I just rationalize I hear that on, on uh, the CDC where the U.S. is now, it's a big subject to bring in carbon tax for the revenue purposes. But how they bring it in is another question. <laughs> and it, it would have probably no effect on, on the world of biochar unless, unless it, like I say, it raises the price of fuels. Um, but it, it really, I mean, it, it becomes a regional issue. Like for instance, in Toronto, where we're trying to get rid of, we're trying, the city is trying to deal with the dying trees, Emerald Ashbore, hundreds of thousands of dying trees, almost a million trees in the city, not expected to die. This is a cost issue for them. The Toronto District School Board and the Catholic District School Board are now saying, look, this is going to cost us $10 million. We don't have it in the budget. What are we going to do? Well, maybe we can make a revenue out of it. Maybe we can produce electricity. Maybe we can create district energy systems. Maybe we can produce some biochar and then produce some, mix it in with some compost from our green bin program and produce some fertilizer that can go back to grow some local food. These are ideas that we're trying to bring.